turn that in and that's all you're asking for. Is that going to be a problem if you're not expecting for the fourth, you know, parcel of land? Okay. Uh, parcel, you know, whether it's bottom land or hardwood okay. or something, so you just so decide what it's for. You were approved for four parcels? No, for four, like planted pines or bottom land hardwoods or stuff like that. And you do, you know, different sections, but you get to the last and you have no more money to put out and you say, well, I'm just going to throw up my hands and quit on this. <coughs> So the question is if you got a con you got a contract to do um, hundred acres on one parcel and you get fifty of it done and you decide you spend all the money you can spend, is that a problem if you stop at that point? And it's no, it's not a problem because it is based on your cost <coughs> documentation. And then we're gonna go look at the map and look at what you did and make sure that, that what you turn in cost wise and what you did is you know, is a, is a reasonable, uh, if they make sure they reasonably match. So in essence, you don't have to do all of the land if we don't have enough funds to buy Correct. But once you yeah, turn it in, you're right. Okay. You're right, once you oh, submit yeah, it. You do 50 acres instead of 100. Yeah, once you submit it and say, I'm done all I'm going to do, then we'll submit the payment and then you're, then you're finished with your contract. And we don't want it, you know, we don't want to tie up a lot of money on, on the other hand, we don't want to tie up a lot of money on contracts and then that could have went to somebody else if, you, if you're not going to do the work. So we've got to you know, try to figure that out on the front end as much as possible. Right. Mr. Martin said that if we check yes on if we received or applied for other government assistance, that would not disqualify us. But we just said that we can't double dip on practice. Right. Okay. The uh, the question was that on the application you got you check yes. Let's see exactly what it says. Have you received or applied for other government government assistance to help with debris removal? So that kind of that kind of leads me into. I was going to talk about federal programs. So you think you just kind of led me into that. And I'll, I'll mention just briefly. I'm not going to go into great detail about the programs. But we've kind of got really four things in play here. We've got three federal programs and a state and a state program for for the brief uh, The three federal programs you've got EFRP, Emergency Forest Restoration Program, which is going to help with debris management associated with forestry. Um, the one little catch there is you do have to replant. It's got to be associated with restoration for the EFRP. For EFRP, uh, there's there's emergency conservation program ECP, and that's going to help the pecan growers and the and the and the orchards, the farmers, clean up debris. So if you had a pecan orchard that was destroyed, you could apply for ECP and get get assistance uh, with, through that. Both of those are are 75 percent cost share programs. Uh, they're both administered by the Farm Service Agency, uh, which is unfortunately part of the um, the partial government shutdown that's going on right now. So we're, we're <coughs> unable to communicate with them, which is kind of hampering us a little bit on trying to figure out how we're going to coordinate these programs. Um, the other one is the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, we call it EQIP for short. Uh, it's through the Natural Resources Conservation Service. I understand that there is some relief money coming down through the pipe in EQIP as well. So that's the third federal program that could possibly assist um, with debris removal. So, and then we've got the, the F-Dump program and then our debris clear and, and road clear and uh, fire break program. So those four, th those, those four things are gonna be interacting with one another. And what, um, what Steve was saying in his uh, talk there is kind of we're trying we're going to get together and figure out how are these programs going to interact with one another. Now, definitely you can't get you can't get double payments for the same practice. So if you do debris clearing uh, on your land, you can't get a 75 percent debris clearing payment from EFRP, and you can't get an 80 percent debris clearing payment from the state program because you would end up making money on that and this is associated with cost. So 
We've got to be um, responsible with the funds because these are these are your yours and mine tax dollars. So we're trying to do what we can to make sure no double payments are made. But what we're trying to figure out is how are these programs going to work together. So if you put in a if you put in an EFRP application and an F-dump application and maybe even an EQIP application for debris management, you're just throwing it all against the wall and trying to figure out, you know, I, I just want to get some assistance. You've got three applications in. How are we as agencies going to work together to make sure we're not double paying? And, you know, how are we going to get the assistance to you? What I will say is that this forest debris management program, um, I know uh, time is of the essence and cash flow is of the essence of the essence as well. So, you know, I know the money, or I believe the money is going to get to you quick, more quickly through that program because we're taking sign-ups now, we're ready to approve, we're ready to, to move forward and working with uh, Georgia Development Authority for them to cut a check to, to help you there. But what we're going to have to do is talk with our with our sister federal agencies to determine when we've made a payment to somebody that's got in an EFR, EFRP application, we've got to communicate that with them to, you know, to say withdraw that part of their application or whatever. So there's got to be some communication. And of course, uh, you all will be in on that communication as well, so you're going to decide which one do I really want to participate in. And it, you know, it may come down to uh, cash flow and timing, it may come down to the amount of money that's being offered, you know, all those sort of things will, will come into the equation. But we're going to have a conversation as soon as the shutdown is over, we're going to get together with Farm Service Agency, NRCS, and us to talk about how can we communicate and how can we make these programs work together because there's a lot of there's a lot of debris to be managed, there's a lot of work to be done, and we believe that all these programs can can work together to help people. It's just trying to, you know, trying to spread it and put it where it needs to go. So, yes, sir. Well, Mark, I'll stay in the corner, sure. How's that affect the program? He asked about out of state ownership. Um, it does not matter if you live out of state. If you own land in Georgia, then you are subject to pay Georgia income tax if you have a timber sale on that land. Uh, you can live out of state and work in Georgia. Say you live in Alabama, but <coughs> your full-time job's in Georgia, then you're filing a Georgia income tax. So that this program would would apply to in-state and out-of-state landowners. <coughs> as long as you, you know, as long as you are the legal owner of the property. And that's the forest debris management program. I got a call this afternoon on that same question, but it asked about a trust. If it was a pet, if it was a trust, instead of a personal ownership, if it was a trust ownership, would that work the same? Um, it would just go back to, and, and we, we've had similar programs where we tied it to the owner of the property and all that sort of thing, and I, I almost, I feel like I'm, so I'm not an attorney, so that's the problem. You start getting into all those different scenarios, but you know, whoever the legal owner of the property is, that's what you know. That's what it's going to go to. So, you know, there's there'll be some scenarios that we just may not have the answer to, but you know, there there's a, there's an endless amount of scenarios out there, especially with with ownership like that. Yes, sir. Do you have a track of land, say 60 acres of timber? Just 10 to maybe 20 percent damage on it. Is that still possible? All right. The question. Thank you. Take your The question was, if you've got 60 acres of timber, and how much? Say 20 percent was damaged. Okay. Um, you know, it's it's going to be able to help you as long as you got the 10 acres of damage. Um, it's going to be it's going to be able to help you and it, and it could be it could be you got six you know it, what this will be the scenario you got 60 acres and then you just have light damage all over the whole property light to moderate and yes it's it's going to help you um you know it'll be you know whatever you can design or you know whatever you can do to get that that down timber out because what it may be is that you don't have enough for really a commercial 
logging operation to come in and salvage what you have, but you still want to get those trees out, reduce that wildfire risk, reduce that beetle risk. So yes, that's you know one of the biggest. It'll you know that you, you don't qualify for EFRP in that situation that, that Steve mentioned earlier. So yeah, that program will be a, will good, be a good help to you. Um, I did talk to a gentleman the other day that's uh, in the logging business and they chip and you know just thinking through some things as far as maybe paying a, 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 log, a logger to come in and pull those trees out because that's probably the best way to get them out because if you go in there with a dozer and you know try to push trees through a residual stand you know you can cause some you can cause some harm that way if you skin trees or get the root rake down and you know you're damaging roots and that sort of thing so you may have to think outside the box to get those stands cleaned up, but that is an option. Once we get the trees out, do we have a beach not to come along and pick them up and haul them away like the rest of it? So what do we do? The question was, what do you do when you get the trees out? <coughs> um, yeah, I mean, you can burn them. You can. I've, I've heard of some, depending on where you're at, there's some, there's a, a crew that might come and chip it up and, and haul it away. So, um, you know, those, those are some options. But for the program, you just have to get the debris out of the stand. So the cost of getting rid of it is not included. We don't include that in the rest of the um, Like, no, sir. You just need, the, the, the question was, does the cost of getting the debris, like hauling the debris, off your property, does, does that count? Um, and I'd say no. I mean, it's you're gonna pile it up and burn it. I mean, yeah, that's the most economic, and that's what we're looking for with the program. We're looking for the most economical way to manage the debris. Um, you know, and, and, and a, you know, doing it in a reasonable, reasonable manner. So hauling it off, you know, that'd be that'd be expensive. All right, so the question is, is logging going to be considered part of debris removal? If, if the logging costs you, costs you money, then yes, it could be considered part of debris removal. But if they took it, if they cleaned it up for the trees, then there would be, it's all based on costs. So whatever you whatever you call the cost documentation you have is what the payment's going to be based on. So if you made money, there's no cost. If you broke even, there'd be no cost. So, but if they did it for a fee, then yes, that would be part of the debris removal. So, I mean, if they charge more than normal for their lot, that would be considered a, a, a fee above what. You if the logging, if you're paying a logging rate in that example, or. There is a rate off of some. Yeah. The most landowners don't. I mean, it's there, but they don't. Right. They pay it, but they don't know it because it's coming out of what they get. Again, it's cost. So if you got cost associated with it, I mean, not, I mean, at the end, of, you know, at the end of the day, the bottom line, there's always logging costs, but the landowner ends up, even though the landowner makes some money, it comes out of the out of the total. If you signed up for EFRP, which most people have already done, mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't it be better not to apply for any funds under EFRP if we've signed up for this? In other words, it's really with an 80 20 split, it would be better to stay with the uh, FDUM program instead of EFRP. Yeah, the question was if you've already signed up for EFRP, it seems you would just be better off not to do EFRP and sign up for this program because the rate is 80% versus 75%. And, um, you know, that's a good point. It just all depends on how much, you know, if we get requests for $100 million worth of forest debris management, you know, there may be some proration involved. So, you know, that, that may be an issue there. So I, I would just, uh, if you don't, I just put my put, put all my, you know, my irons in the fire and see how it shakes out. If you don't apply for the EFRP funds, you know, just go ahead with this and hold that EFRP in abeyance and then see how it comes out. Can you go and then apply for 
the EFRP? The EFRP window um, is coming to a close. Actually, they had a 30 day sign up. I think it may be different in different areas, but I know it was coming to a close right before the, the shutdown. So, what I'm expecting to happen is when FSA opens back up again, they will extend that sign up period for EFRP a bit. That's what I'm expecting to happen. I was actually told that they would. Uh, they were going to continue to take applications anyway for a little while after their 30 day sign up period. So there will be some time to sign up for EFRP, but not an unlimited amount of time to sign up for it. But you don't have to accept the product if you choose to not accept Yes. Yeah. 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 You could choose not to apply. Right. <laughs> I mean, not to say it. Yeah, if you can approach the EFRP, you can you decide not to accept that portion of the There's a big, there could be a problem there with, with double payment 
if we don't have communication between the agencies. So the, the Farm Service Agency, they call you know, they use that producer term because they do deal with a lot of people who lease, they don't own the land, they're, 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 they lease it. Um, but in, in the forestry realm, we're used to dealing with the landowner. So that's kind of how we structure it. But both, you can't have this, the, 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 the producer can't apply for, for the forest to breed land for the you've got to be on it. But in that scenario I mentioned to you, both of them could get paid for the for the I mean that that could be a that could be the scenario. They had both had cost documentation to go and the producer's not the only what they said. The producer's not the only he's still qualified for ECP. For ECP he could qualify as a producer could, but not for the forest to break down. Alright, got a little confusion about the deadlines to apply, and I appreciate I understand that. And, and um, there's two programs: the, the the debris clearing from fire breaks and roads, where the GFC is going to come in and use our equipment to, to clear it, as the February 28 deadline. <laughs> And the forest debris pro debris, debris management program has a, has the February 11th deadline. Thanks for bringing that up, just so we could further clarify that. Thank <laughs> you. 